I'll do a little bit of promotion in the beginning and then. Okay. And we're going to be seeing you only at first, correct? We're going to be seeing both of us. Oh, okay. all right. We're ready right. to start. Hello, this is Dr. Scott Warden, the TOS guy from beautiful Sunnyvale, California. It's gotten cold here. The winter is coming. I hope everybody is doing well out there. Thank you for coming and viewing. We have a special show today. But first of all, I want to ask you, remind you, please subscribe if you haven't already. That really helps us. We're trying to get to our first thousand subscribers, which will enable us a lot more rights on YouTube. So please subscribe or get your friends to subscribe if they uh, have seen us. Second is during our talk, hit the like button. That's a big deal for their uh, algorithm to decide that we're important enough. So hit the like button, get your friends, your dog, your cat to hit the like button. Today, we have a really unique guest, Dr. James Avery. I think anybody with TOS in the Western United States has probably heard of Dr. Avery. And if they hadn't, it's because I haven't mentioned it because I'm always bragging on this guy. Um, Jim, welcome to the show. It's really great to have you here. Thanks, Scott. Nice to be here. I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves, give us a basic idea of your CV from where you started, which is pretty extensive, and let us know where you are now. Okie doke. Well, I went to college at Yale and medical school at Columbia and then did a residency in general surgery, followed by some more surgical residency in cardiothoracic. So I'm trained as a heart surgeon. And you might ask, how does a heart surgeon get involved in this procedure or this, this subject, which largely has been traditionally handled by vascular surgeons? And the reason was, um, and I have only one person to blame, and that's an excellent man by the name of Tracy Newkirk who approached me in 2002 because he was dissatisfied with what was being done locally in terms of the adequacy of the surgery for this condition. So at the time, I was in a kind of lull in the cardiac surgery world for a variety of reasons locally. And so I had time to get kind of immersed in this at that uh, interval of my, of my career. And this, again, is 2002. Um, so it's uh, now 21 years ago. And uh, I then looked at the literature and tried to figure out what would be an appropriate surgical approach to avoid recurrences mainly, because recurrences were pretty common. And that embarked, uh, from that I embarked on a, uh, um, a journey to treat this condition, which for the first 10 years, I, I did in a particularly, uh, I would call thorough and aggressive manner until um, about 2012, roughly 10 years later, when I discovered my surprise in helping a vascular surgeon actually do a vascular uh, case, which happened to involve a subclavian vein in, uh, occlusion. I was really stunned to see how much I could access the first rib from an infraclavicular incision alone. Prior to that, I had done a big operation which involved an incision above the clavicle, kind of in a, tr a traditional fashion, uh, and then added an infraclavicular component. And at that time, uh, I was thinking that this would be uh, most effective were I to take out all of the scalene muscles and all of the first rib and really have the nerve roots, all five of them in the brachial plexus, C5 through T1, hanging in the breeze, thinking that that would be a way of making sure there was nothing that was exerting pressure on these structures. And I was wrapping the nerves in this material that was said to be helpful in reducing scar tissue adhesions, which was a problem. And uh, that, that worked out pretty well when it did. But unfortunately, it was sort of unpredictable in the sense of who would have function immediately post-op. So I got a new approach based on an observation after doing this for 10 years that from an, infra, an infraclavicular approach below the clavicle, one could get far enough back to do what I've considered to be an effective removal of the rib, which was to remove the bottom of this bone-on-bone -bone vice that some people have as a functional problem. Now, this that's started right. in 2010, uh, 2012, correct? 2012, that's right. And so you've done a group of patients before that and a group of patients after that. Yes. Uh, and I want to get back to that in a little bit because uh, I have an outline of questions. And because of your rich history, you've got so much to tell. We have to figure out how to get it into a, a short show. Where are you right now? 
And what's your official title? Right now I'm um, in San Francisco at California Pacific Medical Center, where I function mainly as a heart surgeon. And in particular, as I'm in the tail end of my career, I'm an assistant only on the routine cases like we did earlier today. On the other hand, when transplants happen, which we do uh, so far 24 this year, then I will jump into the plane and go procure the heart and bring it back for the my other two colleagues to Im- implant the thing. In the early days of doing transplant, I was uh, fortunate to be uh, able to do both ends when it was required, but it's gotten um, a little more organized now so that that kind of um, wild and crazy stuff isn't going on anymore. But it was uh, it was always a satisfying thing, and we did our first in 1984. So wow. that that's that's forty. Is that forty years? Well, yeah, that's wow. right. So heart transplants are amazing. You must feel incredible saving somebody's life like that. It's probably the most satisfying thing I have done in my life. And every time, as I'm driving home, it amazes me that we can take a heart out of one person and put it in another person and have the thing work. And it's incredible to me. Now, how did you learn to do that? Well, that was a medical school thing that was um, that was my first introduction. And, and that was in the early, very early stages of transplantation where we didn't know how to diagnose rejection and the immune suppression drugs were terrible. And uh, it was only after the introduction of two things that the results got better. One was the... Uh, better immune suppression drugs, cyclosporin, and the other was endomyocardial biopsy, which allowed us to know when rejection was beginning to happen so we could nip it in the bud rather than wait as we used to before this time for there to be some outward or external marker of of rejection. That was too late. This may be something you don't know, but my understanding was that the first heart transplant ever in the world, Dr. Christian Barnard, that he knew it was going to be rejected and he went ahead and did it anyway. Uh, That could be true. He actually was in Palo Alto. Well, actually uh, it was in San Francisco because Stanford used to be here and uh, Norm Shumway was working in the lab here at CPMC. uh, And then when the, when uh, about half of the faculty moved from this facility, which used to be Stanford to Palo Alto, uh, Norm went as as well, and he did all the all the lab work, so to speak, the bench work to figure out how to do it as a mechanical thing. And uh, Barnard basically stole the information, ran down to South Africa, did the first one, and it was sort of a big deal. But that was sort of the end of his career too, because then he went off into the weeds of other pursuits. Mm, wow! So he was here. I didn't know he, that he was. Uh, yeah, he came to work with. Uh, and to see what uh, Norm Shumway was doing at our facility. And then he ran home and did it in South Africa. So at the time, <clears throat> people were not doing them here, not for mechanical reasons of the procedure, but because of these other factors? Uh, the other factors, yes. And the the mechanics were worked out, as I say, by Norm in the lab here. And what was waiting was the evolution of better immune suppression medicines, as well as a way of figuring out rejection with the endomyocardial biopsy early in the course when it was much more successfully treated. Wow. That is really cool. Think about where it is today. Yeah. Cool. So let's go back a step. So when you started TOS, uh, Tracy Newkirk approached you. And what did you know at that point about TOS? I thought of it probably mostly as an arterial disease because that's what was taught in medical school. And I think, unfortunately, that was the case for most doctors. Um, It was appalling to me that people had the attitude that if I can't find it, it being uh, a diagnosis that this patient has who's got a normal neurologic exam but is complaining of nerve symptoms in the arms Mm -hmm. with their hands and arms in certain positions, the the attitude was very common that if I can't if I can't diagnose it, it doesn't exist, and I'm sure patients out there, some of whom have uh, heard, probably most of whom have heard from a variety of doctors before they get to a person who does believe this thing is real. It's not um, imaginary and and it's not made up. Uh, before you get 
to that sort of an individual, you hear that you don't have anything wrong with you, and it must be very uh, disappointing, to say the least, to the to the patient to hear that the thing they're suffering with isn't an entity. But that was the prevailing attitude at the time. There were people even back then that believed in it, and Dick Sanders was one of them, a, a surgeon in uh, in Colorado, whom you and I both visited early on in in the career. Uh, as I was wanting to see uh, how the guy who wrote a book, the book, uh, approached this. And he did a fairly standard uh, supraclavicular approach. So that's why I did that at the beginning. And as I mentioned, the only reason I changed was that the operation that I did, which was a lovely uh, exposure that took five hours and all the people in the room loved to see it because no one had ever seen that area of the body exposed in that way. Hmm. Uh, I could never tell whose arm was going to work, and uh, it was just agonizing for me the, and the patient. The super, the super cliff the avicular super approach. Avicular where all the nerve roots were hanging out in the breeze, and yeah. I was exposing the phrenic and all this kind of jazz. So yeah. there were a lot of nerves involved, and uh, it, it turned out to be um, a big question mark as to who was going to have arm and hand function immediately upon awakening from the operation. Fortunately, people's uh, their function resumed, but it was unpredictable. And while we're waiting for the nerve um, uh, resumption to occur, and I'm not talking about division of nerves, but just severe inflammation primarily from the exposure and the manipulation required in that operation. Now, and you, that's you may of, not remember this as well as I do, but in one of the many surgeries I've gotten the chance to observe that you performed, <laughs> the very first one, you were showing me how careful you were with the phrenic nerve. And you were like, don't touch it. Don't breathe on it. Don't even look at it. You know, it was so delicate that it couldn't yes. be disrupted or the hemidiaphragm would be paralyzed. Yeah. And, and it, it's it, trouble breathing. And so you to, may you, so to a lesser me. extent, that happens with the remainder of the brachial plexus. That's right. And you may recall the phrenic itself looks like the size of a pencil lead. And yet it's yeah. it's one of the crucial ways that uh, the way that the diaphragms are innervated yeah i remember that very well um so you started with tos and you brought up an interesting point that it was mostly done by vascular surgeons and to some extent some of the largest published publication artists uh authors some of the people of the biggest names in the field right now are vascular surgeons because that's their territory but for my right. two cents it's a different disease. Um, so they know the anatomy, they know the anatomic area, which you call tiger country because it's so complex. And I've told people that. And so it's taken some time and evolution for other specialties to get into it. But also there are people like you who have learned within the field, starting out acting as a vascular surgeon, you've now taken the new approach. So let's talk about that in a little detail. About 10 years ago, you decided you would take this infraclavicular approach and it was because a vascular surgeon was doing it for a different reason. Yes. And uh, again, I was so surprised to, to find that coming into that region of the body from under the clavicle, that one could expose the first rib adequately enough to be able to get the portion of the first rib which acts like the bottom of the bony vice. And if mm -hmm. I could use my fingers as prompts here. Um, Do you want an image? Oh, oh that's even go. better. That's fantastic. What I'm looking at in this image is one of the um, netter drawings, as you can tell by the style and the age of the drawing. But I think there's no image that is more beautifully drawn with one exception that I'll mention in a moment. But what I was um, surprised to find is that the incision below the clavicle allows me to transect the first rib through the cartilage bridge using a kerosene rangeur, which is a neurosurgical instrument. And then with that detachment in the front, I could move the rib laterally and medially and expose intercostal muscles that attach to it, as well as some ligaments on the inside curve of the first rib and get all the way back to where the first rib has approximately a 90 degree turn from being uh, an anterior posterior 
orientation and a fairly straight flat bone to a right angle turn when the bone is reattaching itself to the the um, the top of the first thoracic vertebral body T1 so if one goes that far back in my opinion that's adequate in the sense that what we're trying to do with the surgical approach to this condition is eliminate the the compression that can happen between the clavicle above and the underlying first rib. And keep in mind that all the ribs are oriented in the same way, namely high in the back and low in the front. And as the clavicle sitting on top of that first rib moves back, which it will do because it's hinged in the front where it attaches to the top of the sternum called the manubrial body, allowing the shoulder that's firmly attached clavicle to the acromion process of the shoulder blade, that clavicle is going to be moving posteriorly when I move my arm as I am now preparing, say, to throw a ball. My clavicle is moving toward the back of my body as much as it possibly can by, by that action of my shoulder and arm. And when the clavicle gets close enough to that underlying first rib, it will compress what's between the two. And what's under there is a vein, the dark blue subclavian vein, an artery, the bright red subclavian artery, and some yellow things, which are nerve roots. And the only thing I would call to Dr. Uh, Netter's attention, were he still alive, is uh, that he put the nerves way too low. And I can tell you, just based on seeing this about 100 times in the operating room, that when we look at the at the back of this drawing where we have a first rib started to pass underneath what is the middle scalene muscle, one of those red muscles. Uh, at, at that point, we now typically would see the T1 nerve root coming up from the inside curve of that first rib, mm -hmm. again, near the middle scalene muscle, and C8 would be lying right across the head of that rib. And so, the, the point being that the further back you get coming from the infraclavicular approach, the closer you get to the nerves. And I learned from that first 10 year experience that one of the things I don't want to do is expose the nerves because any exposure of a nerve is like any exposure of any part of the body. Healing involves the, the creation and formation of scar tissue. And when you have a nerve that has been cemented to its next door neighbors, soft tissue, then every time you move your shoulder or arm, you have the potential for triggering a nerve symptom because the nerve is gonna be tugged rather than sliding, which it typically would do, but in the presence of adhesions, it becomes stuck. And so you'd like not to have any exposure to the nerves, ideally, because then you avoid scar tissue formation. You also avoid the potential for injury to the nerve. But I think more importantly in this context is that you don't, you don't elicit this healing reaction because you haven't exposed it. And therefore the nerve slides and it doesn't trigger nerve symptoms. Now so, I'm, I'm going to bring up, uh, I'm going to climb up my soapbox temporarily because there are many publications out there by again, some of the big names in ask the surgery who as part of their standard procedure do an aggressive neurolysis uh, that they believe there's scar tissue forming around the outside of the nerves. And so they kind of strip down the nerves. This is exactly the opposite of what you're saying. And you've got decades of experience. So um, I, I, I don't need a comment from you unless you want to, but I can tell you that I've seen post-op MRIs with very inflamed brachial plexus components. And yes, uh, that's quite right. And, and and I have done a couple of neurolysis procedures myself on patients when I thought maybe it would help, but I'm convinced that it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't help is that, as I, as I just mentioned, when, when, the, when the body is healing any kind of a wound, and surgery is a controlled wound, obviously, scar tissue formation will happen. It's part of the reason that we can survive and was evolutionary, for evolutionary reasons, very important that that wounds would contract and car scar tissue was involved in that. But in this context, having scar tissue is not a good thing and it always comes back. So if you do a neurolysis, that may work for a few weeks or months, but it's not gonna be a sustained improvement 
unless you can eliminate scar tissue and nobody's quite figured out how to do that. And we also know that a lot of TOS surgeons hate redos. Once a patient has had surgery without symptoms improving or with recurrent symptoms, if a surgeon has to go back in, they know they're going to face a minefield of scar tissue. Yes. And the danger of injuring a nerve really goes up under those circumstances. Uh, so it is, it is, I, I would, I would caution anybody who wants to get into this surgical world is to really try to avoid exposing nerves. Uh, however you do the operation, uh, because it will always be a headache and the danger of a re-op is real. So Jim, now when you, I want to ask you a couple technical questions about when you do this, you are automatically getting most or all of the first costal cartilage, the first rib cartilage, correct? Yes. And when you march backwards, you've told me in the past, you go far enough back that you could put your finger there and move the arm and assess whether you've cleared up the compression. Yes, that's how I assess whether in the operating room I've done enough to eliminate any contact between the clavicle and the residual first rib by having the patient's arm, let's say it's the right side we're doing. So the patient's right arm would be in a sterile sleeve. It's part of the prep and drape of the, of the operation. And I would put that uh, sterile sleeve on the patient's abdomen and, and secure it there temporarily while I'm doing the operation. When, when, I've, when I've reached the point of thinking I've done enough surgery. And what I'm doing is I'm looking through a, an access of about uh, about this this much space. So mm -hmm. I'm using a, uh, a neurosurgical instrument, a rangeur, which is a radial-based instrument, meaning it's a long, thin tube with a, with a pistol grip on one side and a Pac-Man-like biting um, apparatus. Let me get it in the screen. A little biting apparatus at the distal end of the, of, of the instrument so I can see around the instrument. That's the point because it's a small space I'm working in yet. I want to be absolutely sure when I bite something down with this instrument. And by the way, I'm removing the rib, not as a single entity, but as piecemeal little bites. And then I just keep biting my way like a Pac-Man type thing mm -hmm. toward from the front to the back until I've removed what I think is enough rib. And at that point, I put my finger on the stump of the rib. So I'm under the patient's clavicle and I'm moving the right arm up and back as I'm demonstrating right now. And I do that because that's the most provocative position one can be in, moving the clavicle as far posteriorly as it can go anatomically. And if in that position, there is no contact between the clavicle and the first rib, I stop. If there is contact and I'm feeling it with my fingertip, then I take a little more rib. And that's the part of the operation that I have learned to be very gentle with in terms of the retraction. And that is to say, in order to see at the, at the bottom of this small space, one has to lift up a bit using what's it's called a brain retractor. Literally, it's a, a very flimsy aluminum flexible retractor about uh, half an inch wide and about three, four inches long. <laughs> Not at all complicated, but it just allows you to just gently lift up what's in the back, which is going to be T1 at the mm -hmm. bottom of the five and C8 next door. They travel as a pair, usually all the way down as the posterior cord, which becomes your ulnar nerve. So I'm trying to just lift up the nerve enough to be able to see distinction between bone and non-bone before I take the last little bit. So I, I'm very cautious throughout the whole operation but especially so when it, I'm getting very close to the back where I know the nerves are going to be, but I don't want to see them. I want to stay away from them. So in this approach, I'm going under everything. I'm going under the subclavian vein, which sits right under the clavicle, under the subclavian artery, which loops up a good bit higher than we normally see from the textbooks. And then finally, the brachial plexus nerve roots, C5 to T1. And the ones I'm going to encounter, as I mentioned, are T1 at the bottom and C8 coming next. So now, I know I, I'm in that region, but I got to really take it easy and, and guard against trying to do too much. By necessity, this means you're doing an anterior scalenotomy, releasing it from the first rib. Yes, I come upon the scalene muscles, which I'm going to detach from the first rib. First, the, the anterior scalene, as you mentioned, and then a little further back, <coughs> I see very clearly these muscles, they look like kind of a strip of bacon under high tension. And the, the anterior scalene first, and, and I use what's called a bipolar cautery 
to do the, the so-called cutting. This is electrical current, but very specific at, a, at literally a pinpoint, as opposed to a usual bovi, which is a machine that you, you press one little button and a whole lot of electricity is delivered to the tip of the instrument. It's kind of like a shotgun versus a rifle. Uh, the bipolar is much more precise, and that's the rifle side of the equation. And I use that instrument to do all the work releasing intercostal muscles, releasing scalenes. Mm -hmm. And the first scalene, as we were just saying, that I encounter is the anterior scalene. And once I divide that with the bipolar at its attachment to the bone, it, it's like a rubber band under tension. Mm -hmm. if, if you have a rubber band under tension, you cut one in, the rubber band, whoop, retracts right back up, back up to where it's attached, as happens with the anterior and middle scalene muscles, which are still attached to the transverse processes of the cervical spine. But mm. we found from an early experience, you may remember, Scott, and um, a woman that we were doing a venous um, approach because she had an unusual neurologic condition with inadequate venous drainage. And we, we re-imaged her three months later and found that the scalene muscles had largely atrophied in the neck and they'd just mm -hmm. kind of gone away. Something that also happens with the pectoralis minor that I've come to learn is an important component to take care of too. It is a coracoid process attachment and comes across the neurovascular bundle in the mm -hmm. armpit attaching to ribs three, four, and five. It, it also is under tension and that is a clinical diagnosis you make going into it. And then with imaging, we can verify indeed that there is um, effacement going on underneath that muscle and therefore it's playing a role and that muscle also is under tension and retracts back on to the chest wall when it's divided so the anterior scalene when you finally uh bipolar you remove it it retracts upwards towards the ear yes. and the pec minor when you remove it from the coracoid process that retracts downwards towards the ribs yes toward the chest cage that's right okay. So uh, compared to the supraclavicular, to make it clear for our viewers, the supraclavicular approach that many doctors take is they take away two-thirds or more of the anterior scalene by dissecting around the nerve roots, which is something you've learned not to do. Yes. Well, as, as a matter of fact, it's, it's one of those things that you don't really know anything about uh, before you get into the subject. And that is that it's usual, and this was from my experience of 10 years of doing this, to see C5 and C6 going through the body of the anterior scalene. It's not just near there. Frank Netter in his drawings, bless his heart, always does simplify things for good reason. It's easier to learn it initially. And then you get into the actual anatomy and the details are a little more complicated. And we're all, right. as you know, we all have the same stuff, but the details of how it's arranged is quite a bit different from one person to the next. You, you, but what you can you're count technically, on- you're Mike your microphone cut out for a second. So you were saying the anatomy books always show it as the nerves going between the two muscles, but yeah, that's not reality. And that's not reality. The, the nerves are going through the muscle or uh, it would be extremely unusual for that not to be true. C5, very typical. C5 and six often, and seven often was going through the middle scalene. So the idea is you can't just go whopping through the scalene muscle without first peeling it back to see if there's a nerve underneath. And if so, you have to kind of um, extract the muscle from around the nerve. And that's the kind of manipulation that makes the nerve very unhappy. Swelling, not injuring it, like cutting across it, but it, it disturbs it a lot. And that's it's best not to do that at all, in my opinion. So looking back now, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, you've been doing the two approaches for two decades. Um, what is your retrospective comparison of the procedure, uh, how the patients do immediately, how the patients do long term? I think in terms of long term, it's, uh, it's probably the, the newer approach is probably better. Certainly the immediate in the recovery room evaluation is now productive. It's predictable rather, and it's reassuring that at the end of the operation, the patient is going to move their hands and arm. And the only thing that they, uh, the patients tell me about that's a new issue and it's a new symptom, but it's fortunately not a functional issue, is that they will have sometimes a patch of numbness in their forearm area. I'm just going to outline my own, on my own forearm in this kind of region of the forearm 
Uh, and that's, I'm sure, from retraction of the T1C8 compo, and it's an ulnar nerve distribution kind of sensory dysesthesia that goes away typically after a few weeks. Some people hmm. have none of that other than incisional pain. And um, one of the things that I make a big point about is to get the shoulder moving right away so as to eliminate and prevent a frozen shoulder, which can be a monster problem to get to get treated. So it's best avoided. Excellent. Um, what do you think? What are the changes in the uh, diagnostic approach you've taken over your career? How have things changed uh, and how confident do you feel on making the diagnosis well, I have come to rely on your imaging approach, Scott, so much that I have, I am very reluctant. It's happened a few times because of certain details, but uh, I am very reluctant to go forward with an operation without the confidence that I get from seeing the results of your scans. Namely, to see that when the patients are in the scanner with their arms elevated, hyperabduction, there is bone on bone proximity and in some cases severe proximity closeness that the two bones are acting like a vice and there's evidence that is not somebody's interpretation but just it's there of effacement which as you know is a is a generic term that indicates any kind of physical pressure on any nerve in the body it's real and radiologists are trained to see it but they're not trained to see effacement of these nerves, nor do they understand a lot of them, that in order to elicit this problem and to, in effect, prove that it's there, one needs to move the arms while the image is being done. And I needn't tell you that everybody in their arms, with their arms down, who hasn't had a birth injury is going to have normal plexus looking images. But totally. it's only when you I, we, we, as you know, we'd like to be in this position, arms up, stick them up position, because it's the most provocative, but we can't fit in the scanner in that position. So right. at least the compromise of hyperabduction moves the clavicles back a bit. I think it underestimates what's really going on in, in the real world with that patient, but at least it's I showing agree. that even in a compromised uh, provocative position with the arms up, there is evidence when people have this condition, and you can show this very well, evidence of effacement when the arms are in that position, the bones are getting close enough together that they're squishing the nerve roots. That's the thing I really care about in terms of having no anxiety about bringing a patient to the operating room who doesn't have the condition. And I, and, and as I said, I have only on a handful of occasions and now over 200 patients total of mm -hmm. having, uh, doing an operation without your imaging study. I now feel that that is a sine qua non for a successful outcome. That's great. I, I don't have to toot my own my own horn because you did it so nicely. Thank you for that. Um, we are proud of the work we do, and we think it's really based on a lot of uh, our experience working with people like you. As you know, when we discuss patients, we always get way down into the nitty gritty. And uh, I have a firm belief that TOS is not low hanging fruit, that most patients need a team, doctors who work together because it's just too complex for a single doc in most cases to figure out and treat it's yep. my two cents and and so i want to thank you because for decades i've had the chance to have resources like you and dr newkirk and other people around the country to learn from um so let me ask you this when you examine a patient what do you think after your full evaluation is the best predictive factor for whether they'll do well with surgery how long they've had the condition i think the lunge the um uh, the patient who has had these symptoms, and I'm talking about nerve pains and when they do certain things, arms in certain positions and so on, could be constant numb numbness and tingling, anything nervy. If those symptoms are a year or two old when they are diagnosed, worked up with an imaging study and then presented to a surgeon, do you think it's going to help, blah, blah, blah. I go into that surgery with the expectation, quite frankly, that things are going to do well. And uh, I want to make a distinction between doing well from a nerve vessel point of view, which is really what the operation does, as opposed to doing well from the total package point mm -hmm. of view. And that gets mm -hmm. in 
to my belief that TOS is really a front and back issue. And the front side of the story is what we've been talking about, nerves and vessels coming out of the neck, going in through the scaling triangle, under the clavicle, over to the shoulder and down the arm. That's what the operation that I'm describing and that I've been doing and have been advocating, that's what that operation is treating, that part of the problem. The back half of the problem is a guarding response that I think develops virtually always, especially after years and years of having this problem, which is shrugging, where the shoulders come up and forward. And it's, I think, the expression of the inherent guarding instinct that we all have as humans. And the example I like to use with patients is to say, well, what would happen if you or I were walking on uh, on a sidewalk that was uneven and we tripped, we fell forward, landed on our hands and broke our wrist. We got a Collie's fracture, let's say. Without thinking, without any cognition, the instinct in all of us is to surround and protect cradle the arm, surround and protect the hurt part. And I think what shrugging is doing is the body is trying to protect the hurt part, which is brachial plexus nerve roots coming out more or less from the front of the body. It's in the neck, in the middle, and I know the spinal cord is in the back, but those nerves wrap around from the back and come to the front, and they're more or less coming to the front of the body. So if the pain is originating from the anterior portion of the upper body, the shoulders up and up and forward, I think, are just responding by trying to surround and protect the hurt part. Unfortunately, that becomes such a deep muscle memory that the patient doesn't even notice they're doing it, first of all, or understand why there's always this pain in my upper trapezius. It turns out the upper trap, levator scapulae, rhomboid minor, those are the three muscles what we have uh, nicknamed the shruggers, and they are the ones primarily responsible for lifting the shoulder. And the uh, the pectoralis minor is one of the ones involved with pulling things forward, which, as I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, I've become more um, tuned into the fact that that's an important thing to evaluate. And if it's a part of the problem, definitely take care of, because there have been a couple of cases before I got this level of uh, awareness of the pec minor, who had to have a pec minor after a successful rib because, the, in the, and this usually would be in, in um, people who are techies, they'd go back to their computer mm -hmm. and with their arms forward, their arm would get suffused because the subclavian vein was being compressed by the pec minor with the arm in the anterior uh, uh, keyboard position. So now I really look for that. And if it's there, I do it at the time of the rib operation so that there won't be any further mechanical compression of anything post-op. So basically two steps of healing. One is the decompression, and the second is the returning the muscles and posture to normal. Yes, and that feature is extremely difficult to treat without this posture vest that Tracy invented. And um, uh, I, I'd say that it's not for everybody because not everybody can tolerate it. But boy, when it works, it really is effective. And it's the only thing, I, in my experience, that does anything meaningful. And by that, I mean that the, the muscle relaxants never work. Botox temporarily might. Massage helps at the moment. Soaking and all the usual stuff that physical therapists uh, like to do is is fine, but it isn't uh, more really than a temporary fix. So, so what Botox, like to, Botox has not had good results for you. Botox is variable. It sometimes people get worse, and if it works, it doesn't stay working for more than about three months. So mm -hmm. it's it's something that doesn't have a ring of uh, real uh, effectiveness in my book. And this vest that Tracy uh, uh, fashioned called the Body Boy was uh, very successful when it's when it's tolerated by the patient. And he and I see a little different approach to using it, a more a sequential, a nuanced little, little bit at a time pulling back. Because what it does is pulls the shoulders down and back. And what we're trying to do with whatever the approach is to undo the deep muscle memory that's it's evolved, which is I'm going to demonstrate shrugging and replace that deep muscle memory with a more relaxed deep muscle memory. That's the, that's the goal, but it doesn't always happen. So and, Dr. And, Newkirk's and, approach is even pre-op to try to reposition the shoulders. Yeah. Uh, and, by your theory that you have to decompress, then that's not going to get rid of that primary problem. 
Yes, and unfortunately, when the muscle component, the shrugging component, doesn't get better, and um, for a variety of reasons, then the patient's perception of the operation is that my computer just shut down. We're with you. I can hear you. Huh? I think we're frozen here. All right, we'll let you sign in again. Hopefully, it should be soon. And I'm going to take a couple of uh, questions here if we have a question or two. Actually, I'm going to wait on that because um, Jim might want to answer some questions and our viewers might want Jim to answer the questions. So what we've been talking about with Dr. Avery, uh, and I want to complete this question, is what's a good predictive factor? What does he believe is the best predictive factor for a good outcome? And he talked about the patients coming to see him without a long delay one to two years. And this is something we here at Vanguard Specialty Imaging have emphasized. We believe that the diagnosis um, needs to be made early, but that won't happen with a lot of patients. And I'm sure the viewers know this, that they go to see doctors and the first or second or third doctor may not know anything about TOS and maybe hasn't even heard of it. So that's where uh, certain things like social media can raise awareness while it doesn't treat it. It certainly raises awareness and then allows people to search for help on the web. And one of the things we offer on our website is a lot of education about TOS. So hopefully you as a patient, if you do have it, you can advocate for yourself when you go to see your doctor until he or she says, okay, I'll read a little bit about it, I'll figure it out, or I'll refer you to my colleague, a specialist who does know about it. So again, we emphasize here to advocate for yourself, and that's through gaining some knowledge, which is now readily available. We all know Dr. Google, even I search sometimes rather than a textbook. And then to armed with that knowledge, work with your doctor to find the right knowledgeable resource to help you figure out whether it is or isn't TOS. And of course, we believe in what we do here. So our scan, we believe in the right patient is an important part of that. Um, we believe that it helps either confirm or rule out TOS as necessary so you can be treated for TOS or treated for the other condition that is uh, there and causing similar symptoms. Hey, Jim. Hi, I'm back. All right, good, you're Sorry back. About that. So let's go back to the predictive factor. You said patients you see that have had the symptoms, nerve symptoms for one or two years, mm -hmm. you're pretty confident. And you're saying that patients who have had longer symptom existence without being diagnosed, those are more challenging. Definitely. They are less likely to have uh, a spectacularly good re uh, result. I think everybody feels somewhat better in some ways, not everybody. But for the most part, people are improved. Um, and again, the thing that I think influences their perception of success is heavily tied to the shrugger muscle problem. In other words, if that doesn't get better, they're still walking around with pain in their muscle a lot. And life is just not good. So it's, uh, it's, I think it's important to address that and probably the body boy is the one thing that can work. And so I, I Dr. Newkirk. the Dr. Newkirk's yeah. advice, yeah, it's a, it's an so orthosis. Wh why do you think some patients get to that point of beyond two years without a diagnosis? Well, probably they've been uh, going to doctors who haven't uh, been able to make the diagnosis or don't feel like thoracic outlet syndrome exists in, in the first place. And so they are kind of either not diagnosed or misdiagnosed and, and um, people will have uh, operations that may be a carpal tunnel release or an right. ulnar nerve transposition or something like that when indeed the problem is coming from up in the brachial plexus area, not more peripherally. So I think that situation was very common when I'd see patients in the first part of my career of uh, TOS surgery that they'd had a lot of operations, none of which did anything for them more distantly because it wasn't recognized that the problem was up top. And again, I think doctors, uh, to give them a little bit of a break here, were taught in medical school uh, the Adson maneuver and TOS, and it was associated with uh, the diagnosis. And that's an arterial problem, as you know, which is really only about 2% of the total population, whereas about 95% of the population who uh, people who have thoracic outlet syndrome have neurologic symptoms, not vessels symptoms. Right. Subclavian vein occlusion is dramatic as can be because the arm turns purple, gets swollen, and you think you're going to die. That's very obvious. We, but yeah, we don't see those patients. They go to the ER. They, yeah, yeah, and they get, they get lysed and things get better. And then they may see somebody to uh, get the first rib removed. Right. 
So that's, that's prevent a great, recurrence. That's great the way you put that. Yeah, the AdSense maneuver, AdSense was just brilliant, you know, and but in the 1920s, that's what he had. He didn't have MRIs or CAT scans. Yeah, and, and he was oh. right. That anterior scalene, which is an accessory breathing muscle, not anything relating to strength in the neck. I want to point that out to, to people who are considering mm. this. And that is that, well, if you take those scalene muscles, they look like they're important structurally, right? They're going for the first rib and they insert in the neck on the transverse processes. But indeed, they're they're just functioning like intercostals to to flare the rib cage. So if diaphragm breathing provided by the phrenic nerve isn't enough, which is what you and I are using to breathe right now because we're quiet sitting around talking. If that isn't enough, then you add chest wall expansion and that's intercostal nerve and or, or rather intercostal muscle function to, to uh, expand the rib cage and create more volume uh, exchange. Actually, embryologically, don't ask me why I'm such a geek about this stuff, but the scaling muscles are a similar formation to the intercostal muscles. They come from those same layers, the anterior, middle, and posterior scaling. They devolve a bit. They actually create channels within the sheet of muscle due to the nerves growing out, but they are embryologically of the same body muscle layer as the intercostals. So it's exactly what you say. When we need the intercostals for secondary breathing help or the anterior scalings, that's the only time they're necessary. And I just had a patient two days ago ask me this very question, so I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, for all our viewers, you can have the scalings blocked with a drug like uh, lidocaine or Botox. You can have them removed, and it should not affect your life or your neck or your strength. The strength of the neck just comes up from the paraspinals in the back, and rotational strength is is, is created by the sternocleidomastoid. These ones come from the, the mastoid process of the skull down nice to the, the anterior chest wall. <clears throat> And we don't touch those. They're not, they're not part of the story at all. It's the scalenes that we're after. <clears throat> and those are bigger. The sternocleidomastoid is bigger it's anyway. A, it's a strong. big, strong muscle. That's right. So um, we, we were talking about patients being seen by the wrong docs and stuff. So one of the things I talk about with our regular viewers and people who contact us is uh, that awareness of TOS that the public now has access to through Google and social media and all these things that can spread something virally. I think that's made a huge difference. So for me, I wanted to ask you, what change have you seen over your career in the number of patients who've gone five years versus the number of patients who get a timely diagnosis? I think they're more getting a timely diagnosis, quite frankly. And I think that population tends to be young people, often techies, who are uh, surprised that they have these nerve symptoms and so on when they haven't had an injury and they're at, the, at their computer all day and all that stuff, but uh, they're surprised that they have a problem at all. And I think one of the most, um, most of the most satisfying anecdotes that I can tell you about was a young guy who was down here in San Francisco climbing one of the climbing walls, and he noticed that when his arms were up like this on the wall, his hands got numb and he couldn't grip things. So he said, "This is getting dangerous." And he called his dad, who was a retired thoracic surgeon from the Mass General living in New Zealand at the time. And <laughs> this guy, this guy said, oh, you've got thoracic outlet syndrome. Go see Avery at CPMC. <laughs> and he did. And we did him, we did his, his both sides. And he has had a total complete reversal of all the problems. He didn't have the diagnosis long enough to develop shrugging. So he just did beautifully. And uh, he's, he's, out living his life in New Hampshire at the moment. Unfortunately, a lot of patients we see don't have fathers who are retired thoracic surgeons from That's the Massachusetts right. General. Who, who, happened to, who happened to recognize what was going on immediately. Yeah, lucky. That's lucky and good. I love those stories. <clears throat> so uh, computer use is one of those things, I think, locally. Yeah. Um, that It's just making this worse. I, I think the incidence is growing of TOS, what do you think? Are we just recognizing I, it more? Is it occurring I think, more? Yeah, I think it's recurring. It's occurring more, Scott, because of the computer use and so on. But I think it's also being recognized more. And I'm thinking now of a recent case, a lady who is an ultrasonographer who was for 10 years doing this kind of stuff with her with her probe. And, you know, it may not be evident to people, but you have to push pretty hard on those things in order to get a good image. So there's a lot of weird angulation and, and, and exertion of force in odd situations uh, that goes along with that profession. 
And she was just getting more and more pain, uh, but put up with it and kind of tried to got through it until 10 years went by and she was miserable and had to stop working. That's when she came in, got diagnosed and stuff. But um, I think had um, uh, had she consulted the Internet, possibly she would have been given a clue. I don't know. But I think the Internet has helped a lot when people are surfing around trying to figure out what's going on with me because I don't have a diagnosis and I don't understand what's going on. Um, they they start to get clued into this possibility. And then they, they might contact you through your website or somebody else and through their exploration, get to somebody who does understand and be able to tell them, yeah, this is what you got and here's what you ought to do. Uh, I, again, will remind our viewers, please subscribe to us. If you haven't subscribed, we're trying to hit the magic 1000 and definitely hit the like button. If you like what you're seeing here, I'm sure with Dr. Avery, you, you like it. So, uh, Jim, we've seen a few baseball players, more than a few elite uh, baseball pitchers being diagnosed with TOS. And yes. whenever that happens, I will reach out to the reporter on ESPN and the, the team. And, uh, and I never get through because these guys are such high value they're owned by only a few doctors in the field. Um, we do get to see some of them afterwards. And, um, you know, I I hesitate, you know, with such valuable properties, why we're not doing more uh, imaging and stuff. But um, I, I try to view it as a positive that if someone famous is getting TOS, that the public sees a little bit more of it. And I believe now what you said is true. I think there are people who are recognizing the words when they see it on the Internet. So hopefully that's a trend in the right direction for us. Yeah, I think it is. And the ones that we've seen, as you may recall, Scott, are all left-handers who have a <laughs> particular value because to be a left-hander and be able to throw 95 miles an hour, that's oh, yeah. a career. I mean, I that's a lot one, of money. One young man we saw who's, yeah, whose dad called me while I was making dinner one night. And he said, you don't know me. I'm an attorney in Palo Alto. And my brother is a professor at Emory. And he's been helping me search around the country for a TOS specialist. And today he said to me, you idiot, there's a specialist here in Sunnyvale, California. So, uh, and we helped him out. Really nice young kid. And uh, I remember after you did the surgery a few months later, he was playing soft, toss, soft uh, throw with his dad. Yeah. And he said, I can feel my fingertips. Yeah, that, that comment I remember forever. I can feel my fingertips when I'm throwing. Yeah. He hadn't felt them in 10 years. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. So tell us a little bit now about what the future of your practice is and you know what evolution is going on and how we can let patients know. I'm going to be retiring completely at the end of June next year. And so what I have planned to do is to pass the baton to another surgeon, a cardiothoracic surgeon named Peter Anastasio. Peter all has is more thoracic than cardiac, uh, but he, I've known him for a long, long time and think highly of him because he's a fine human being and integrity and all that stuff, and he's smart. So he's often been in surgery with me because he's been interested in this for quite some time. And uh, I more and more am telling uh, new patients that if they uh, are candidates for surgery, you may want to wait until uh, Peter comes on board. Uh, and the, the reason I have offered that suggestion to them is because I, I don't operate and then walk away from patients. I'll see them a lot post-op to see how things are going. And if things aren't going the way we'd like, both of us, the patient and me, uh, we'll try to direct them in a way that makes sense. So uh, Peter is the same way. And I, I think you can't just do an operation and then call it a day with patients who have this condition. Because again, so much of the problem has to do with the muscle component, as I've said. And uh, if they have issues about nerve changes as a result of the operation, I can be there to help them understand why, why it is and the likelihood of it getting better. So uh, my practice, so to speak, would, would uh, in this area is going into the hands of Peter coming the end of June next year. And already I'm starting to uh, prepare patients for this change. And there are a few patients that I've seen chronically over the years, uh, not so much because I can do anything more for them, but they've, they've gotten confident in me giving them advice kind of in general, medical advice. So Peter, Peter's the future from our center who will uh, basically uh, do the same approach. He believes that this makes a lot of sense. He's very happy with the relatively non-invasive nature of this approach. 
And he's very happy with the results from this approach. So I think he is a true believer that you don't need to do a big thing. The one exception is if you got a cervical rib, you got to go up top. You can't do that one adequately from underneath. It's just too far away. But if you have a cervical rib, which may be combined with a typical first rib problem, um, that has to be addressed from the top, the cervical rib portion. Uh, but the the rib, the primary first rib resection, I think, can always, and always is a dangerous word, but I would say 99.999% of the time can be addressed adequately and safely from an infraclavicular approach. So Peter would be doing the same operation, and right. he's been around for a lot of them. Uh, participating in the evaluation process. Have we done enough, you know, with the finger on the stump and so on, moving the arm, that he will do that. So I think the uh, the the quality of the work that he will do will be first rate. It's great to hear, although it's sad uh, for me personally and for a lot of patients uh, to know that you're retiring. If I could just say that. Thank um, you. Uh, so Peter, who I haven't met in person yet, but I will, um, he, he'll be doing the same procedure. Are there any other people you know of in the country or region that offer this procedure, this approach? Uh, I'm sure there are. I just don't know who they are. Okay. And I, I think, you know, Dick Sanders was our, our uh, go-to guy at the first part of my career, and I think yours as well. Um, and I, I would be surprised if he's doing it any differently than he always has, a supraclavicular approach and uh, removing stuff in that way. Yeah, Dick is a very, very nice man. He's re been retired for several years mm -hmm. um, or semi-retired. He'll still go in and observe and coach, but mm -hmm. I don't think he's doing the procedures himself. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably true. Yeah. Yeah, he was very gracious to us when we got to meet him in Colorado. Yes, he certainly Remember was. That. Yep. Um, so what do you think the future of TOS is? It's a broad question, I know, but shoot from the hip. I would like to see more doctors recognizing that it exists, first of all. And um, I would also hope that uh, people will come to find value in the kind of imaging that you have been doing all along. Uh, to be able to appreciate when the nerves are being compressed and the vessels, but primarily the nerves we're talking about. Um, I, I think that is the, the, the first step and the essential first step is to even as a physician consider that that might be a possibility and then to prove it by getting you do with imaging both with the arms down and the arms up and being able to read when there is effacement going on in that situation that the arms are elevated. So it's the awareness of the condition, number one, spreading, I think is going to help a lot. It's a slow process, but I think, again, for reasons of, um, I think it's increasing incidence in the population with keyboard use and so on. And the internet as a source of information to learn about what it is and also to see uh, how is how is it worked up. So hopefully awareness among both patients and physicians. Yes. So the keyboard uh, causes symptoms and then helps patients find a solution. So yes. the keyboard giveth and the keyboard taketh away, I guess. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, let's see if we have a question here that we can uh, ask you from uh, one of the viewers currently here. Herb? Not Gugu Pa says, hi, thank you both for doing this. Thank you for viewing with us. When unilateral scapular pain is the most debilitating symptom, what is a typical surgical approach vis-a-vis -vis the nerves you address? And do you always remove a rib? Well, I I, I think from the question... Um... And yet, the further follow-on question. Let's go back to that. Uh, is I accidentally posted the question before the chat. Your talk answered my question. <laughs> That's great, Jim. You already helped him. Um, my follow-up question is, if you are not one of the lucky ones to be diagnosed early, what should you do? Well, I, th I still think it's appropriate to get seen by a physician who knows that the condition exists and get worked up uh, with a, a good thorough physical exam, looking for signs of nerve tension and so on, and follow that up by um, an imaging study of the type you do, Scott, where we are imaging both in the arms down and arms up positions where we can then elicit 
both symptoms with the arms up and image in that position. And from that, see compression of the nerve roots. Excellent. Jim, do you have anything else to add? I want to personally, first of all, thank you uh, for making the time to be with us. I know how busy you are. And uh, as I said, it's a little sad for me. And uh, I'm being a little introspective about the fact, thinking that I knew someday you'd retire, just like Tracy. But uh, with a concrete date coming up, it's a little bit <laughs> more real. So uh, it's going to be a shame when patients don't have the resources like you and Tracy around anymore. I'll just say that. Well, what do you... you. What do you plan to do with your future? Uh, well, I think I'm going to not stay um, attached to medicine much um, when I walk out the door. Um, we have, um, uh, my wife and I are uh, teaming up with another couple from the East Coast and um, are going to explore life in France for a, a chunk of time in rural south southwest France. Uh, you'll have your own vineyard, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably not. I think we'll... We'll just uh, live there and start to get a, a sense for what's life like in Europe. Uh, a few times I've visited with the family. It's pretty amazing there. Yeah. So uh, count on us visiting you. Definitely. The door is always going to be open. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed uh, meeting a true, uh, respected, highly respected, experienced TOS surgeon and hearing about what's happened with TOS over the course of his career. Uh, Dr. Jim Avery's office can be reached. Uh, we can always give you the contact information through our website if you didn't catch it here. There we go. <clears throat> I'll remind you that I'm Dr. Scott Warden, the TOS guy. You can reach me through our website, tosmri.com. We also work with toseducation, no spaces, .org. That's toseducation.org. We'll have another uh, presentation, a live stream in two weeks with a speaker to be determined, and we will send out our emails to the usual people and the usual suspects. Again, if you haven't subscribed, please help us out and please hit the like button. Jim Avery, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you here tonight, and we'll see everybody soon. Thank you, Scott. It was nice being here. Bye-bye.